Hey, welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. It is definitely bedtime sleepy time, but since I am crazy, I am up and I had a great idea for a short video to help beginners with hooking a number eight uh, primitive strip, a wide strip. Um, I got this idea yesterday when I was uh, doing a Zoom class and I thought of an easy way to explain directional hooking for a beginner using some props. So I'm gonna get right to that excuse the pajamas and the insanity as always. The problem sometimes, particularly for beginners, um, if you are choosing to first hook a number eight primitive, uh, sometimes called prim, these strips are wide. So this is probably the widest strip that you will use. This is what most cutting machines will do, like the top strip. Um, it's very wide and it has its pluses and minuses. Uh, one of the pluses is it will hook faster because it's a wider strip. Um, it's very easy to see what you're doing. It's very easy to get nice, simple modeled background effects and fill in background spaces with, uh, simple folky type patterns. It's the right, it's the right size for those things. If you are a person who loves detail and fineness in your work, then you're going to strip with something that's at the other end of the spectrum, like a number three, much, much, much more narrow. And there are benefits to this too. A benefit to something like a three this is more like a hair or a piece of uh, very fine um, yarn or not quite thread uh, compared to an eight so these are if you have a cutting machine and like a bliss or a Frasier and you've got the full spectrum a uh, spectrum of cutters you probably started a three and ended an eight so these are two opposites of the uh, spectrum but I just turned the light up so hopefully you can see better so there are benefits to both. With the much thinner one, it's, it takes a while. It's extremely fine and fiddly. I, I never, never, never use different hooks and I rarely recommend it unless I'm working with very fine yarn and I need a tiny, teeny tiny little hook like this. Uh, I normally use my normal big hook like this. This is the difference between these two, if you can see that. Um, it's quite a big difference. But this one is super, super fine. And I would use that. <clears throat> you don't you don't always get a standardized system with rug hooking needles. It's like primitive is a large one for doing big strips like an eight. And then the, the very fine one is just small or fine. And you can do everything else with it. But don't buy 12 needles. Buy one or two and then you're good. Um, so when you when you hook with a very thin piece like like a three, like I've got here. I'm going to pull through a few hoops loops for you and show you it comes out really 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 fine dainty tiny scale um, and again you probably know this already and I hate being repetitive but it's always good to hear something good twice when you're pulling up your first loops um, they're never perfect mine are not perfect now it's it's getting late but I'm, I'm also very imperfect the, the general rule of thumb when you're hooking anything, whether it's a three, eight, or anything in between, is you hook the height, so you pull it up about as high as your strip is wide. So I would be pulling up for an eight, something about this tall, standing up off my backing. So that's general rule of thumb. So I'm having no trouble at all hooking my, my little three. It's very, very, very fine, very small. It's gonna take some time but you know, it makes nice little loops. Um, if you don't need to do something this small and you're looking for more of a primitive folk look, you're gonna be looking at more like an eight. So I'm gonna to switch to my bigger guy here. I'm gonna pull him up. Now this is not a beginner tutorial in terms of like how to hook. This is just something specific. I'm gonna show you about directional hooking with larger strips like an eight. So I'm pulling these guys up and you can see that the difference is quite notable. I'll bring the camera closer down. Those are much bigger loops, right? So you're seeing that they are much bigger loops than the three. Now, what can become a problem with using a bigger, uh, wider strip like the eights is it can be very tricky to make turns. Doing any kind of directional hooking is trickier when you've got a much wider, fatter piece because you need to turn something this big into, you know, uh, turn it on. You, you don't necessarily have to do hairpins on every pattern, 
but you might get hairpins, you might get many hairpins, you might get circles, vines, flowers, and those all have crazy turns, and it is hard to turn an eight. So I'm gonna show you quickly how and why it's hard to turn an eight, a primitive um, cut, and what you can do for yourself to make life, to number one, understand why you're having trouble making turns, and secondly, how to negotiate these troubles and make life easier. So the first thing I want to say that makes, hopefully makes sense, we're, we're going with a Halloween motif here. You see what this is? This is candy corn. Now, if stitches came up like candy corn and you wanted to do circles, you would have no problem, right? Because life would look like this, right? If stitches came up, if loops came up looking like this, like little triangles, you'd be able to turn things just like this and you'd have no issues, right? That's not what loops look like. Loops look like this. I'm going to pull out my big one so you can get down to one, right? It's like a little rectangle, right? It's like a little line, like a little rectangle. So forget this. Some of those will go in my mouth. So good. But what do loops really look like? Uh -uh. They look like Pez. Remember these guys? I'll put them here for effect. I love these guys. So this is what your stitches really look like. A little rectangle. Now, how are you going to turn rectangles into turns and circles and curves and flowers? That is the question. If, if you are struggling with that, it is not because you're a beginner. It is not because you're bad. It's not because you're not getting the hang of it. It's because they're little rectangles. So if you think about it, if you have a pattern that like my try to remember that we've been hooking, that's a circle and it's something like this, a stylized rose, like a um, Macintosh type rose. Don't mind the colors because it has nothing to do with anything, but you're going to be wanting to fill this flower with stitches that look like this. And you're going to be saying to yourself, how do I get those turns in there? This is going to be impossible, isn't it? Well, it's tricky. It's tricky. And it's something that you practice and it's something that you learn. And it's certainly something that you're going to get sooner rather than later. But the first thing is to understand that this is your problem, right? You identify your problem. I need to turn a bunch of tiny rectangles into something round. What I would recommend in doing something like this is just what I started doing. Start your tail somewhere like here and then start immediately hooking like this as close as you can now something different about pez and wool spot the differences right wool is much more pliable and mushy and it will mush together pez will not it will mush together in my stomach but it will not mush together on this piece of paper but you know that your wool will mush together better so the best thing i can do with a curve like this with loops like i'm making is to turn gradually and start on the outside. You can start on the inside, but if you start on the inside, you're gonna immediately be confronted with, I have a space this big, how do I get any loops in there? Am I supposed to do this? Well, you can, but you're gonna have a bit of a square then, right? If you do two loops like that, I've got a tiny little center. You might end up doing something like this, a little triangle and then having your little tail come up in the middle at the end you're going to figure it out but if you start a difficult shape like this on the outside where you have a little bit of time to catch your breath to figure it out to get into a rhythm to practice then you're going to be in better shape in half an hour when you get to the center so i would always recommend doing that you're going to come to points like i'm at now right these just don't fit anymore. I've already put these, these loops in. I'm going to have to start doing monkey business like this. And you know what? Does it look perfect? No. Is it going to look perfect in five minutes when I'm done? Yes. And it's going to look even more perfect later when I block it with the iron and I relax all these little loops. It's going to look even more perfect. Now you can see with the Pez, I can get myself in a situation where they want to they want to line up and go over to one side rather than continue being concentric circles. That's what loops do too. 
it's the same exact shape. You can push and pack, but if you pack too much, you're going to end up with a lot of warping and denseness that is going to be noticeable. So you have to make decisions as you go. Sometimes any hooker will make a decision like, you know what, this is as far as I can get in this row. I'm going to end it right here and make a tail. And then I'm going to start over here and do something different. Turn it this way. Try to keep the circular stuff going because I accept with the tools that I have, with the number eight that I'm using, um, with things being the size they are and not uh, magically pliable, that I'm going to have to make some decisions about where my loops go. And I'm probably going to end up with something that looks like this. And are there little gaps that are called holidays? Yeah. Let's say best case scenario, I got one more loop in here. Are there little holidays in this? Holidays are little gaps. Yeah, there's a ton of little holidays. But is it a filled in flower that is the color that I want it? Yeah, it's a filled in flower and it's the right color and it's going to look great in the design. Now, you could have done better than I did in the middle here. You could have done more to get your a circle within a circle. But the point I'm making is that when you're hooking with an eight, you will not always be able to make smooth, easy directional turns. And it's just the way that it is. And you have to accept that while you're hooking it, or you're going to frustrate yourself and want to give up. You have to believe and have faith that at the end, all the little loops are going to mush together and you are going to have a filled in shape that is going to look beautiful. You're just doing your best to make good decisions as you go as to where to place the loops when you've got tricky situations like this. So flowers aside, that was an extreme situation. If I was doing something else like, let's see, what else would we be doing? Maybe like a cat, right? I'm thinking about jam sandwich. I'm always thinking about jam sandwich. This is like Jossie's cat. Super folky. Boy, did I go to school for art school four times for this or what? So if I was going to do something like this and I had a primitive background, we'll get all our players back out here. Um, I would be needing to hook around him. Now, when you get primitive patterns like this, you know, the borders are always something, something, something. And you got a lot of swirls in here. And where do you begin and end your swirls? And is there a right way and a wrong way? There's usually not. However you swirl it, if you get a cat with swirls in the background and that's what the pattern is, then you did good. But when you're hooking it and you're new, you are again confronted with the problem of spacing your loops and getting loops that turn. And you will again, even with a design like this, have to make difficult decisions about how to make your loops, let me move these over here, run and make sense around your pattern. You have to also remember besides loops that you can cut, leave your little tail up and make decisions like this. Can you see what I'm doing there with the cat's head? Right, and then maybe cut again and then come up here again. You have to be creative in the way that you think, but the main thing is to realize how many options you've got and not be defeated by the problem of doing directional work. When you've got these little, I'm gonna move these back here. You've got these guys. This is extreme, right? Your, your loops are not as big as Pez but you're going to be doing something like this and following your lines as closely as possible. When you get to your tricky parts, you're going to be stumped and everybody's stumped when they get to these parts. You just do your best to get as many of your loops in as you can. And you're going to find that when you, you might have to leave little tails in certain places to fill them in. When you get to your second round of where you need things to be, it's hard again. And you have to make decisions as you go and really manipulate as you go. So you can fill in as much space as you can without packing, packing too much together, and also without a lot of holidays, meaning gaps. So it can be done. The thing is that it is tricky. And it's, again, I just want to make the point, it is tricky for everybody who hooks. When you hook with an eight, which I love, I love primitive designs and hooking with an eight, but I encounter this every time too. I encountered this a lot with the try to remember pattern because there are circles and there are lots of turns. 
and you just have to remember that your loop is coming up like a little rectangle the same as mine is so you're just planning for it accommodating making decisions as you go you can always pull out a few loops if you find that it really is a pig's breakfast but chances are you're being too hard on yourself if you're making too much of it and if you're overthinking directional hooking you just have to stop yourself just grand scheme of things perspective pull way back just stop yourself and think about pez and even draw something the shape of what you're trying to hook and say okay if i could only have pez to work on this then what is the smartest way i can start this to get the curve line that i want as smoothly as i want and to be able to work all the other stuff around it it's not rocket science rocket surgery brain surgery brain rocket anything um, but it is tricky and it's fiddly and those are the toughest kinds of things to do so hopefully the pez analogy the pez demonstration versus the candy corn um, was a good way to explain what you're tackling when you primitive hook and you need to do directional hooking um, and I want, again, for the last time to let you know that you are not alone in struggling with this. Everybody who primitive rug hooks struggles with directional hooking. It's a tough thing. It is the tough thing about um, primitive rug hooking number eights because you can talk to anybody who hooks very, very fine in number threes and half of them are at least are going to tell you I would not hook in eight because it's so difficult. And the reason it's difficult is because it's hard to do directional stuff because of the size of your loop. So think about it, plan it, do it, attack it, and just be open um, and thoughtful as you go. Everything in life as you go. Hooking same as life, right? I hope that was helpful. And I will see you soon at Ribbon Candy Hooking. We are into our every morning coffee breaks, every weekday morning, Monday to Friday, on the Ribbon Candy Hooking channel here half an hour between 11.30 Eastern Standard Time and 12, talking about different things each day that have to do with rug hooking, punch needle, supplies, fun stuff. See you soon. Have a great night.